Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special episode of, uh, I guess this will be an episode of whatever this is, uh, the YouTube show where I talk with my friends about various stuff. Normally, Ephraim is sitting across from me. As you can see, that is not the case today. Uh, I have my friend Alexis here with me because she is a big fan of the Resident Evil franchise. And I'll admit, I'm not a big fan, but I have watched a bunch of playthroughs of Resident Evil 8. And I got a little questions. And just as a story guy, like my biggest critiques are of the story. So I kind of wanted to get into it a little bit with you, Alexis. Uh, but to, I suppose to begin with, how did you like the game? I loved it. I uh, was not disappointed at all. And I find the replayability of the game super high. Uh, I'm already on my third playthrough and um, I'm enjoying it. Dang, three, like I've watched three playthroughs to be like, oh, I'm, I'm on my third playthrough is impressive to me. Like, good God, I would I want to say I wouldn't be able to play a game three times in a row, but I'm watching people play it three times in a row. So what, what, what can you say? Um, I, I got to say, I watched playthroughs of Final Fantasy, not Final Fantasy, Jesus, Resident Evil 7. And I really liked 7 because it leaned, I felt like it leaned more into the horror element that had been gone for a long time. Um, I liked Ethan as like a, a cypher character for kind of the audience. Um, I was really annoyed at the end when they pulled in more classic Resident Evil story elements and 8 is definitely firmly like Resident Evil story elements are here. Um, how does that feel? Like, did it make a difference for you as someone who's been playing the games the whole time? Well, you know, I'm not going to lie and say I'm not happy to see characters from previous installments. I'm very happy to see characters from previous installments. Um, I think Capcom is very interested in tying the series together while trying new things. So with Resident Evil 7, it is a uh, it is a return to survival horror. And even in a different way, you know, the jump scares are a bit more intense. Yeah. You know, items are not as easy to find. Uh, very claustrophobic Resident Evil 7 is. And for the first three classic installments of Resident Evil with the tank controls and the fixed camera angles, you know, that claustrophobia is experienced in a different way because you can you can hear the bioweapon or the monster from the hallway over, but the camera's not going to show you where it is, so you know more often than not you're going to walk right into it. So that's a jump scare in its own right, but in Resident Evil 7, it's in your face. Yeah. And if you choose to play in virtual reality, which I did a few sections of the game oh. in virtual reality, it was a very, very intense experience. I can't imagine. Um, I was very happy to take the visor off. <laughs> so really, I just continue on my PS4 regular mode when playing Resident Evil 7. But yeah, they did bring Chris in in Resident Evil 7 to tie the story together because this is a world of bioweapons. You know, that's how Resident Evil doesn't border into supernatural stuff like it's not a magical fantasy world like there is science fiction um explanations as to why these things happen so in resident evil 7 it's the mold you know it's you know an organic thing that has been tinkered with to be weaponized so in resident evil 8 they do the same thing and it's even heavier like you said in resident resident evil 8 than it is in resident evil 7 you know you got chris redfield you know everybody's favorite stars boy is back and you know he's doing some ill shit with a whole team you know and i'm happy to see him uh but yeah i like it when they tie it together i think if you were to make a game that was kind of standalone on its own people would question is this really a resident evil game and a lot of people question you know what makes a real resident evil game a lot of fans online are like ah there's no zombies it's not a real resident evil game you know I, the way i've always looked at it is the resident is evil there sure. is something ill going on here, and usually all of them have a science fiction bioweapon explanation as to why it's happening, and it satisfies that Resident Evil requirement. So for me, like I think with Resident Evil Village, they did a really beautiful mix of giving Ethan a little bit more personality. You get to experience this new character a little bit better while still having some old faces show up, and it was a good balance. So I think they did a really good job with that. That was um, when I first started watching the RE7 stuff, um, knowing that it was so different until, like I said, until the other elements came in, I was kind of looking at it as like, oh, this this is going, 
maybe they're going the direction of this is like a horror Final Fantasy thing where every game will just be its own thing from now on and they'll just do whatever the fuck they feel like. Um, and that was kind of where I thought they were going with it. And then once you start to see the like, oh no, Umbrella was involved in this and here's Chris Redfield. And it was like, oh, nope, this is definitely in continuity with everything else. Um, I don't know. It made me a little sad because it, uh, and I don't know why. Normally, like, I like to get into stories with everything. Like, when I buy comics, like, if I find out something's connected to something else, like, I'm buying the other thing. Like, even if it's bad, I'm buying it. <laughs> uh, just because I, I want to know and I want to experience that. Um, and that was to your, to your uh, secondary point on the sci-fi versus fantasy. That was one of the first things that threw me when they did, like, the first trailers. And there's, like, werewolves running around and a big vampire lady. And I'm like, these are, like, <laughs> these are classic horror we consider them fantasy art tropes like frankenstein was a, like a sci-fi concept um but yeah that's that really threw me i was like i don't know what they're doing with this but like clearly they're going even weirder and then they're just like no it's it's more like mold and bio experimentation i was like oh yeah i guess you could do that like that makes sense uh it, it makes me a little sad uh for like the the potential of what could have been kind of thing but i also understand you don't throw your brand away after 20 plus years of development and building and like you said investment um even as someone who's not a big resident evil fan when chris showed up i was like chris redfield what this is, what are you doing and then he you know especially since he keeps mutating the way he looks like he looked very gerard butler this time around oh. which i thought was kind of i was just like oh he looks more like an action star this time like cool good for you chris oh uh, my when he showed up at the beginning uh before i go for before i go further Total spoilers for the game, everybody. Um, if you haven't seen it or played it, please do so. Um, otherwise, we're going to be getting into the shit. Because right off the bat, they shoot Ethan's wife, Mia, at the beginning of the game. And I absolutely <laughs> didn't see that I was, I was like, when I first saw that trailer, or when, it, when we got more footage of Chris doing that, I was like, they. I was so mad. I was like, they better not make Chris a bad guy. He has been a good guy against this fight for so long, and I was like, I'll be open-minded, but I'm gonna be pissed if Chris Redfield's a villain. But of course, when you play through, context comes into play, and you realize that that initial feeling is not the case. Well, and that's, um, I believe in one of the games, was it Jill was, like, mind-controlled or something? Yeah, in Resident Evil 5, um, that installment was about, you know, Chris going to West Africa dealing with a strange parasite uh, infestation in the Kijuju Autonomous Zone uh, and uh, you know Jill's been missing for a while and you know as you progress through the game you find out that you know after a botched mission with Chris and Jill uh, looking for Spencer the uh, founder of Umbrella Wesker's there and you know shit goes awry and uh, Jill tackles Wesker out of a window both bodies were never recovered. Um, Classic comic book, they're not dead. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, assumed, they no were bodies, assumed dead. <laughs> they were assumed dead, and then you find out that Jill is actually alive, and she has been mutated a bit via the parasite and some other um, viral uh, antigens uh, by Wesker, and you have to fight her, and you okay. have to kind of get the... Uh, get the things that's controlling her and making her that way removed from her body to uh, bring her back to your side again. That was right at the beginning. Like I said, when, when the scene went down, I was like, maybe he's being mind controlled. Yeah. Like obviously bioweapons are a huge thing. I was like, maybe he's a clone. I like, had the same thought. I thought perhaps, do that? yeah, I had thought perhaps that he had been infected by the mold. That was my, sure. That was my initial thought that Chris, you know, maybe picked it up on accident in Resident Evil seven um, or something had happened where Chris had, you know, Chris had been fighting bioweapons for so long that maybe some organization like, well, why don't we just remove this player from the chessboard by making him play for our team because he always shows up and saves the day. Sure. So um, that's what I thought that he was perhaps under, you know, as more trailers came out, you know, you realize that the, you know, the puppeteer behind this is not this nine foot, six foot, six inches woman. It's this Mother Miranda-like character, so not the Lady Demetresque, but, um, you know, uh, I was just like, oh my god, please don't be a bad guy. <laughs> that was just my main, my main feeling. Like you've always done the good fight, Chris. But then at the same time, a lot of people are like, well, you live long enough, 
you'll become the villain. And sure. I was like, Chris, don't do it. And in, in theory, you know, you've got your new lead character. You've got somebody to be in the game. Yeah, you don't yeah, have to yeah. be Chris anymore. Uh, since we brought her up, we might as well discuss <laughs> Lady Dimitrescu. Ah, uh, um, yes. Which, which for me is mostly interesting because the internet fell for this woman hard mm-hmm. uh, in a way that the internet rarely falls in love with anything. Uh, and then everybody was kind of shocked that she was only in X chunk of the game. And everybody was like, that's it? Right. You monsters? <laughs> uh, and everybody got really upset about it. And like, I don't know, just how did you feel about it? Well, the whole situation. You know, I, I don't know what Capcom's intentions were. Like, was she supposed to, like, maybe they didn't know that Lady Alcina Demetres was going to be super popular. Sure. You know, due to her being the first, you know, boss of the game, they probably just, like many games tend to do, they just kind of show you some of the opening gameplay and then kind of keep the rest of the gameplay under wraps until it's purchased. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if they intended for her to be as popular. I, I wonder if I could ask if there were, uh, the if I had the game directors with me right now, I'd ask if you had known she was going to be super popular, would you guys have made her a longer part of the game? Maybe we'll see some DLC content that features her a little more heavily. Well, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, no, uh, I mean, I wasn't, like, super disappointed that she was just the first section of the game. Uh, I really enjoyed my time uh, running from her. <laughs> that I was very... I find her very scary. Like, even though she's a very, obviously, what I find and what many people find an attractive woman... Uh, she's still very frightening. It was amazingly uh, intimidating when you would yeah. see a door open and yeah, she would exactly. enter. Exactly. It, it was somehow scarier than, uh, who was it, Mr. X in the RE3 yeah. remake. Like, I was still like, I would seize up a little bit, just be like, oh yeah. shit. Yeah, oh, it's, shit. it's a different dynamic because Mr. X and Nemesis, so for Mr. X from Resident Evil 2 Two. remake and Nemesis from Resident Evil 3 remake, they don't speak to you. I mean, I don't really count saying stars as a conversation. Yeah. Um, so that dynamic's not there. But she's shouting things at you. She's accusing you of things. She's more humanoid than Nemesis and Mr. X. And she's bigger than <laughs> Nemesis and Mr. X. You have this big, sentient woman who's very upset with you. For like, I mean, like you're going in her castle. You're acting like Link. You're smashing all her very ornate very old things no one seems to notice yeah right and you also have you know her daughters attack you so you know obviously you have to fight her daughters and the end result of that's not something she's happy with either so it's definitely a different dynamic it's still very scary she's tall and statuesque and beautiful but when like when she when you're walking around and i've tried to hide from her a couple times i'm like i'm I don't know why I thought I could hide from such a tall woman, but I thought perhaps I could duck in certain <laughs> places. hunting ability. Right? And I would think, oh, she's leaving the room. She hasn't sensed me. And then right as she's about to leave, I hear the shh. Like, her claws come out. She's like, there you are. And I'm like, oh, my God, how did she find me? <laughs> and, like, and it's like, click, 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 click from her heels and stuff, you know, which is... um you know, reminiscent of, you know, Mr. X's boots, you know, knocking on the Raccoon City Police Station. You know, it was just like, it was the only part of the game where you're being actively stalked. And, uh, yeah, but like, like I'm saying, like, she was just still scary. She was still scary. The claws, I got swiped a couple times because I thought maybe I could dodge her and I really couldn't because it's not really a huge element. Like, you can maybe duck, but like those, like, combat stuff that you see in Resident Evil 6 and stuff like that's just not really present in the first person shooter you know what I mean so um yeah it's a different dynamic you know because when you're being stalked by Nemesis and Mr. X in the remakes it's a over the shoulder you know there's quick turns you can get away can't really do that in Castle Demetresque or any of the first person shooters because you are stalked by Jack Baker That's, in Resident I, Evil 7. I was going to bring up, I feel I felt like there was more of an immediate threat throughout the entirety of 7 because the property felt much smaller oh at my least, gosh. especially in the beginning when you're it's you and Jack. It yeah. felt like every time you turned a corner he could be there. Where it felt like because Castle Dimitrescu is just so large and grand, you could be on like the complete opposite end of the building and not run into her at all. Or you could be back on the other side of the building and then she just enters the room yep. and then you go, ah, like you were able to relax a little bit. 
And then when you would see her, I think that ebb and flowed a little bit better. Where with Seven, you were just, where's Jack? Where's Jack? I don't right. know. He could be anywhere. He could be right here. Oh, the entire time. And you just hear him. He's like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, like, get me out of here. But yeah, I would say, you know, despite her only being in a short part of the game, I still think she left a pretty good impact. Um, I can understand why some people would feel a little... I wouldn't say gypped, but like they're like, oh, I don't understand why she was so hyped up and it was such a small section of the game. And I just think maybe they just didn't think she was going to be hyped up. And then when they saw that she was being hyped up, they just released more marketing when, content with her in it. When, so. when they discovered the internet, shockingly, is horny <laughs> all of the time. <laughs> they went, oh, that's right. America. Oh. America. <laughs> that's I, I tend to think the same. I think they went, this is our first portion of the game. This is what we're going to show you. It just so happened to have one of the most visually interesting characters in the game as well. And they kind of lucked into having uh, this kind of reaction from the audience. Um, I do feel like in the game, uh, Lady Dimitrescu feels like the most character-based villain that you go up against. That was something that really surprised me when you went to um, Donna Beneviento's house. Like, she, as a character, really didn't feel present to me at all. Versus, like, Moreau, I think, has a has a different story element, which I think is really interesting, and we'll get into that. And then Heisenberg has a big story element. Um, but I, I, I felt like there was so much to Lady Dimitrescu stuff where, you know, you see her, like, have conflict with the rest of the, the family. You see her have conflict with Mother Miranda where she's like, screw the ceremony! Right. Like, even she's not 100% on board with whatever is going on here. Um, it, it, it did feel a little bit of a letdown to me to go from like, oh, this, this character's visually interesting, the plot elements in this are a lot of fun, and then when that goes away, nothing kind of fills that gap for yeah. me. Like, I felt a little... I felt more frustrated by that than anything else. Like, the boss fight was sweet, the castle looks gorgeous, mm -hmm. um... I loved the dudes popping up in like the blood in the basement. Yeah, was not. I was like, that was cool. Uh, it's funny because I hadn't fully explored those areas because the way the map uh, dynamic works, it turns blue once you've found everything you can find. And I've all through my playthroughs, I still haven't cleared that. And a part of me is like, doesn't really care. Like I'm like, <laughs> don't really need to go back there. I'm good. Sure. I'm good. I don't want to go wading through <laughs> hip deep yeah, blood anymore. And it's like. They're like, oh, this is like the distillery. That was all uh, in the. <laughs> I ain't drinking no wine from this area. <laughs> in one of the first trailers, when they when they basically hint at the fact that they're making wine out of human blood and it's humans in in the the caskets. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Ew. so creepy. Ew. That's beautifully <laughs> creepy. Oh, that's that's like Jack Baker level. Like this yeah. is gross, and I love it kind right. of stuff. Yeah, for oh. sure. So then after that, you go to Donna Beneviento's place. Uh, which I loved, like, going up to the, the building itself. It was a cute little house. It was. It's the kind of place where I'm like, yeah, I would want to retire to the European Very countryside. Misleading. And live in this house. That would be great. Um, and I loved the creepy uh, the creepy elements of examining Mia's, like, wooden doll body. And that's how I was like, oh my god, was, like, Mia a doll the whole time? And, like, your brain was being messed with? And, like, mm -hmm. the, the baby's a bioweapon clone or something? <laughs> like... What is this doing? Right. Um, I definitely felt... I do think her house was probably the most horrific for me. Um, but it was so short. And then, like I said, I, I don't think... I don't feel like she was very present as a character. Com right. Especially compared to Dimitrescu. Well, what I think... What was really interesting about House Beneviento is that... If um, people who play Resident Evil may also play a lot of indie horror games. Sure. And one thing about that section of the game is it really um, kind of echoed dynamics from indie games. Because a lot of indie horror games don't let you use your weapons. So a lot of it is running and hiding. That's true. And using your environment around you. And part of these indie horror games, too, not all of them are like this, but a majority of them are. They don't show you the threat. The threat is very present in the background. You can almost feel it. Um, and that's what makes it more scary because you know this threat is here, but it's not showing itself to you. And um, there's a lot of games that are like that. I'm sure some people uh, might agree that, you know, Slenderman or Soma or, you know, Tattletale. Tattletale was this weird um, 
indie horror game that I liked where it was like little Furbies that were possessed. I know. Okay. Yeah. And you know, just little games like that. Um, so house bend and Viento, you know, you couldn't use your weapons. It was puzzle solving for a majority of it. Um, you're getting hints of something to come. And when I, my first playthrough, I kept noticing lockers I could hide in lockers I could open up and hide in. It's like, it's very scary because the threat that I'm like, there's nothing I need to hide from. Why, sure. is, why am I allowed to go inside a locker and hide? And I initially thought that doll Angie was going to start coming for me. Sure. And I'm like, but it's a little doll. Ethan could stomp her, you know, <laughs> but, um, the Chucky problem. Yeah. Right. And I was like, well, I could hide from Angie. Like, I don't know what's it's, something's coming. That's what I liked about the first playthrough. You're finding these places you can hide behind. You're like, something's coming. And, of course, once you solve all the creepy puzzles via Mia's doll, you know, you actually get a glimpse of Donna. Um, and then, as you progress a little further, you follow that really fucked up umbilical cord up the hallway, and then there it is. And what a, like, and to, like, um, part of me wants to complain that there's, if the main house has so little to do or discover... Um, versus once, like I said, once you kind of get into the more of the work area, um, which, I, and I actually thought it was kind of a, I ended up liking that because it was a nice change of pace where Castle Dimitrescu was constantly exploring, constantly rewarding you, like I said, giving you a little bit more story elements to things. Right. And then you get to this house and there's nothing. There, you, nothing at all. And it just seems like a house. And that alone is kind of creepy because like you said, you're, you're expecting mm -hmm. something. Right. 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 Um, and so you, I, I do agree. I think there's an interesting um, pace that I don't think the Resident Evil games play with typically. Yeah. Um, that works really well there. And then, like I said, once everything, it goes red and you've got the blood and the Mia's doll body is gone mm -hmm. and you get that umbilical cord and it's just like... Yep. Are we you... Went. Like, that's, that's where if I was playing the game, I would have quit playing the game because <laughs> that's where I go... There's a demon down this hallway, and it eats people, and it has a, a tentacle as long as fucking I don't know what. I'm out. <laughs> quit. Quit. Save. Thank you, everybody. This it was a great game. It went from zero to 100 pretty quickly, and, you know, it's making that those baby noises. So part of you is like, oh, my God, did they do something to Rose? You know, but you remember the flasks from earlier, but still, you're just like, I don't know what this game is doing, yep. you know? But, um... If Mia's a doll, Rose could be anything. I don't right, know. Right, right, <laughs> right. So, but yeah, House Beneviento, it's a different, it was definitely a different dynamic uh, for the entire game. And also, like, I agree with you, a different kind of different dynamic um, for the Resident Evils. I can't remember if in any of the Resident Evils you lose your weapons. There are times, I do believe, I can't recall them right now. Um, but generally, in, in like from Resident Evil 4 and on before seven there's a lot of like combat heavy stuff so they rarely take your weapons from you um so yeah that aspect of resident evil 8 was pretty cool um to work with in my opinion but um as far as like donna beneviento not being very present um she's present in a different way you know there's not a lot of lore about her in the house uh, for you to pick up on you're, you're very conf like there's, they don't really throw you a whole lot of bones about Donna you have to infer a lot on your own but um most of it comes out after I yeah feel like. yeah and it's not even that much yeah you know and it's just um, like wow this chick's creepy yeah pretty much <laughs> and uh she I mean there's some like you know you get to pick up some lore about a plant you notice there's some books about plants so you know, there's some research equipment in the house, very sparse. So someone's interested in something here. Is it Donna? We don't know, but you could assume it would be. But yeah, and then that, you know, the internet community is like, was the baby creature real? Or oh, was, sure. that... was that in your head the whole time? Yeah. Oh, that's you an know, interesting question. Yeah, so because you learn after reading some more lore for what little lore the game provides you, you learn that Donna was experimenting with plants or she was able to secrete a pheromone to activate plants that were controlled by the mutamycete to make the viewer have hallucinations which explains when you're walking into house beneviento ethan is seeing mia yeah you know and she's saying things that 
you and I don't know are these things that she actually said to Ethan in a memory, which if I think it's a hallucination, maybe she actually never said those things and it's just what Donna thinks Mia might have said sure. to Ethan. Like Donna's main goal, I guess, is to fuck with Ethan for whatever reason. Um, so she, Mia's saying very upsetting things. She's speaking to Ethan through a telephone, through a radio, and she's just saying very off the wall you know, menacing things about their family and implications about Rose, you know, just things that would would upset Ethan or anyone who's a father or mother of the child. Sure. So I um I don't know why Donna, you know, would go about it that way, but you learn that she's mentally ill, so that might have just made sense to her. Sure. And so her presence is to be, you know, just to be in the background and just send these auditory and visual hallucinations your way for her viewing pleasure. Sure. You know, at least that's the way I view it. Uh, before we started recording, you had mentioned a little bit about Moreau and the fact that he's very emotionally different from the rest of the characters where everybody else, even to some degree, like Heisenberg proposes himself as an ally, but he comes off as an asshole. So it doesn't feel like an ally. Moreau is like the only character like you show up on and he's like please don't kill me just help me out man and I've never seen a bad guy in a video game just like sadly ask you to not fuck up their evil plan <laughs> and I was immediately like oh dude I feel so like I just felt so bad for him like oh yeah. and he lives in creepy moldy damp tunnels like <laughs> oh dude got the short end of the stick on this one yeah oh. I um you know you're not you don't know a whole lot about him from the trailers and for your first playthrough you don't really know what to expect um though i think after you're you're going through the playthrough uh, for the first time you can kind of start drawing parallels between the village of shadows characters and um the four lords like obviously the bat in the story is lady demetresk and that that mystical weaver is donna beneviento yep. because she can make things happen and then of the fish you know, the fish that offers a gill, you're like, okay, Moreau is the fish. So when you head to the reservoir, you can expect it to be Moreau and all that weird jellyfish eggs that you have to shoot to get there. And um, so you come up on him and the flask is right there. You didn't have to fight anything. You didn't have to do any labor of any kind. Yeah. <laughs> like it's right there. And he's just watching a fuzzy television, you know, all by himself, by his lonesome. And yeah, you know, obviously you take the flask and he's like, wait, wait, wait. If if you take it, they'll laugh at me. And, you know, you, he's very open about what bother, what bothers him. But then, of course, he tries to stall you. And then he's like, oh, you're stupid. I sealed the way. You know, but you feel like you're having a conversation with, like, an immature 10-year-old or yeah. 11-year-old. You know, like, they, they, they're switching between, like, you know, well, maybe if I appeal to your sense of you know, if I share what's bothering me, you'll just, you know, you're you're supposed to be nice because we're supposed to play nice. That's what we're supposed to do, right? And you're supposed to make me feel better about myself and blah, blah, blah. And then actually know I'm going to be nefarious because I'm not getting what I want. You yeah. know, very childlike interaction. Um, and, you know, I always describe that area as things just kind of take off from the get-go. You know, like it just, like that. Um, so... But yeah, as you go through the area and you're, you gotta make a lot of decisions and, you know, get the ball rolling, um, you know, you listen to the dialogue that he says while you're going through the area. You know, he's like, Pree's Mother Miranda, I'm trying. Uh, I'll do better he's next so time. He's so desperate for either, wh yeah. whether it's her approval or her love. Um, yeah, it's... I won't say it's heartbreaking because he's also a big fish monster who's trying to kill you. <laughs> but, like, it's definitely enough to make me be like, can't you not do that, man? Like, could you just, could you be cool about this and it would right. be okay? Right. Oh. Yeah, no, I feel bad because, you know, in other Resident Evil installments, you know, not everybody wanted to be infected. You know, some of the villains that, you know, they're super popular and who we've come to love from a fandom uh, perspective, like Albert Wesker, you know, Albert Wesker wanted that mutation in his in, life. In theory, most of the zombies are just victims. Yeah. Like, thinking you about it. You feel bad right? about them. You know, I read the S.D. Perry Resident Evil books. I heard those were very good. Yes, the author does make take time to where, you know, 
to mention that some of the protagonists, you know, whether it's from Jill's perspective or Rebecca Chambers' perspective or Claire or Leon, you know, they feel kind of bad. Like, you know, it was once human. They didn't ask for this, you know, and yes, you're putting it or them out of their misery, but it's just kind of like, oh, they are literally just crossfire of somebody's stupid experiment, their, their greed. So you feel kind of bad for that because, I mean, even though in your first playthrough of Resident Evil Village you haven't learned who willingly signed up for this and who didn't, you definitely sure. know the villagers are being held hostage against their will. You know, there's this some religion where they worship Mother Miranda, but That's, you know what I mean? I was going to say, it, it felt very unclear to me uh, b- because the game throws you in after things have started to deteriorate. Right. You say the there's a number of villagers who are praying to Mother Miranda or cursing her for failing them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it was definitely one of those things where I was like, do they... Do they worship her? Is she just like the matron of the town? Mm-hmm. Do they think that she's a godlike figure? Right. Like just just because they were making up whatever they wanted to for this, um, I definitely had a little bit of a rough time in the beginning with it, and then you just you know you just swallow it and keep going because you have to. Right. Um, but yeah, like like I said, you don't really know what's going on, and really, I feel like Moreau's the section that more explains as best it can, what was happening to the village to lead up to everything happening then in the game. Um, and actually, your, your point about the way Moreau was acting, like, his his body was so physically disfigured that it's it would be difficult to tell, like, what his actual age would be. Yeah. Like, because when you meet him, he's already, like, doubled over, like, half of a fish person. Right. Anyways, and he had the, the like, crown he had crafted. Yeah. Which, again, doesn't seem like something an adult would do, but it's something I could see, like, a teenager or a younger person being, you know, I'm, I'm a... He thinks he's a scientist. He's experimenting on people. He's adding the kudo. The mm-hmm. um, I could see him having the idea of, like, oh, I'm important. Like, right. yeah, I should, I should have a crown, right? Yeah, <laughs> Mother Miranda chose me. I have a whole mountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, uh, it doesn't become clear until you read lore later on in the game that it says his mental faculties were affected, so you can assume that they were a functioning adult, and oh, then okay. the Cado and the mold or you know, whatever cocktail Mother Miranda infected him with uh, not only disfigured him physically, but it also affected his mental you know, fortitude sure. and stuff like that, so might have you know, regressed him. A bit, but yeah, you feel bad for him because you he you know he just wants acceptance from the rest of them, uh, and then of course after you defeat him in the boss fight and you've come across his diary, you know you learn that 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 is true. He knows he's not liked, and this is his one t- chance to prove himself, and you just took it from him. You know what I mean? So, but you know. Ethan doesn't care. They took his daughter. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's definitely, uh, you know, obviously Ethan's in the right here. He's just trying to get his family member back. Uh, but, yeah, I felt kind of bad for Moreau on my first playthrough, and on my second and third I still do. Um, though I do have to say I do find some comedy on my last, thir- on my last playthrough uh, when he jumps out of the water and he's like, I'm the best. <laughs> and it's like, uh, why aren't there DJ Khaled you know, Moreau <laughs> memes everywhere, you know, uh, about this. But um, what I will say, the fandoms are being really funny now. They're like, all you guys are simping for Lady Alcina Demetresque. What about for this handsome guy? And they Aww. just put pictures of Moreau. Aww. And, you know, to be fair, I have seen some fan artwork um, that actually does pull on the heartstrings uh, regarding Moreau. One is... Um, it's uh, the whole family's around him, and they're like, good job, Moreau. Aww. You did a good job. The one thing he wanted. And then the other thing is he approaches uh, Donna Beneviento, and he's like, do you do commissions for dolls? She's like, yeah. He's like, can you make me a Mother Miranda doll? Aww. And he has the Mother Miranda doll, and he tells the Mother Miranda doll, like, good job, son. Like, he's creating that warmth that Mother Miranda doesn't give him. Aw, that's so, adorable. Which I think, you know, like, to me, I'm like, ugh. Poor Moreau, but at the same time, he's trying to, like, kill you with his putrid acid, so yeah. he's standing in between you and your daughter, so you have to keep, you have to choose your daughter and go through him, that, so. That boss fight definitely, to me, had the most, like, leaning back towards Seven in terms of, like, this is just gross. Yeah. Like, 
whether it's scary or not, like, it, I definitely felt like that boss encounter was way more action-y than it was frightening, um, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, it, like I say, when he starts vomiting on you, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, come Gross. on. Like, as if this wasn't bad enough, like, your fingers are missing, you're getting bitten by people. Right. There's mold everywhere, like, I know you gotta vomit on me, like. <sighs> Ethan can now on, count in German forever. <laughs> you know, he'll like if he if Ethan was casted in Inglorious Bastards and he held up his hand that was bitten off by a lichen, he would not give himself away Aww. to the Axis powers. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, and um, even though it didn't seem like Ethan had a lot of compassion for Moreau, which he didn't, and Ethan doesn't have any compassion for anybody, uh, for these ca- cast of characters anyway. Um, I just. It is interesting to note, you know, that, you know, the Resident Evil 7 family, you do learn through the gameplay, you know, the Bakers, I forget how, but there's a chance when you actually get to talk to Jack Baker as himself. Yeah. And Jack's asking you to free his family you, from this. You're you're in like a, a mindscape kind yeah. of thing. And he's like, yo, that thing? The mold. That wasn't yeah. me. Like, yeah, it yeah, yeah. makes, she makes you do these things. Yeah. That's what it is. So I yeah. hope in that moment Ethan learns, because, you know, the, the other cast of characters and ensemble of ca- cast that we are familiar with, they already know that humans are collateral damage from bioweapons. Ethan's just a regular guy, um, so he probably doesn't know a whole lot about everything Umbrella and Will Pharma and Tricell have done, you know, in the timeline. You know, he's just a consumer like you and I. That would just be like you and me not having any knowledge that Walmart's been like infecting people with chips and stuff yeah. like that but like some special ops guy has been fighting walmart bioweapons <laughs> for like 10 years there's a whole movie quadrilogy happening in the backgrounds <laughs> of our life and we're like i don't know what you're talking about yeah, but then all of a sudden our significant others get kidnapped by like some you know mowed crazy... down in front of you and what? then you get kidnapped right and now you have to like fight some consequence of like target mold or something fish men and fish men yeah yeah that's a good point though like the supernatural aspects of the game it's almost like you know art kind of like to i think mother miranda you know art kind of imitated life or life kind of imitated art for her she's like well this is already a superstitious environment you know and oh sure you can kind of capitalize off that for control but Nope, there's a bioweapon explanation for all of it. You well, know? That's, that's something I want to get into, because the, the Megamyce reveal, on the one hand, I liked it, and then on the other hand, I hated it. <laughs> and I, I do want to get into that. Uh, but let's cover Heisenberg oh, first, because sure. he's our last family member left. He is. Um, for whatever reason, and I feel bad, I hated his, his way of speaking. <laughs> A lot of people are like that. I'm like the like the from the second he started talking, I was just like, people He's don't talk like this. Like, what are you doing? Are you going for something here? Like, what am I missing? And I don't. I never found it. Um, and then it, it weirded me out. And again, it's probably because of the trailer. Like, the trailer feels like it ties him closely to the lichens. But then once you get to Heisenberg's section of the game, it's very industrial. He's turning people into cyborg zombie murder machines, mm-hmm. like Iron Man, but zombies. Uh, and it, it that disconnect where I was just like, do you like werewolves or do you like robots? Like, you have to pick one, man. <laughs> and it, it didn't feel like he did, but it's, I, I like that he presented himself as an ally. He did try, at least, to be like, help me kill Mother Miranda. And then you're just like, no, nah, I'll kill her. Don't worry about it, man. Like, I like that Ethan wasn't even like, I have to kill you. He was just kind of like, I'm killing Mother Miranda. Just stay out of the way. Right. And then Heisenberg was like, well, you stay out of my way. (laughs) I'm going to go kill Mother Miranda using your baby. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it. Like, that felt the weirdest, one of the weirdest relationships to me. And that's even before you fight Heisenberg the last time. He just gets rid of you. Mm -hmm. He's like, just go away. I got it, man. Uh, and that's a really interesting character relationship in a video game. Again, typically it's just Bowser. You go to the next castle, you kill him, you move on with your life. You don't right. even think about it. Uh, it was it was nice to see him presented as a person, uh, as opposed to just, especially after Moreau, who just wanted to please Mother Miranda. Um, you kind of got an echo of Lady Dimitrescu just being like, I'll do whatever I want, because I'm powerful. Mm-hmm. Screw you, lady. Um so I have very mixed feelings on Heisenberg. I still don't know whether I liked him or hated him. Uh, 
Because like I said, he, he annoyed me, but then he was interesting. Right. I liked I liked his game area. Um, the zombie stuff, the the like cyborg zombie stuff was kind of neat. Um, like I say, I the lichens never connected with me. Um, but yeah, how did it how did it work for you in term again in terms of that like he's not really antagonistic, but he's still in the way. The game doesn't give you a choice not to kill him. You have to. Right. Um. As a character, I. I'm going to say, like, I was in love with the character. Uh, He's not a handsome say, boy. Yeah, he is handsome. I'm not going to say I didn't care for him or whatever, but uh, he was a strange character. Uh, the way he talked is something you kind of notice. He's like, yes, run for your life. You know, stuff like that. Like, he's a game show host, but yeah. in a village. You know, very bizarre. Uh, but, yeah, his area is definitely a lot... Um, you start picking up photographs and files about these really strange, like, experiments he's doing. So you obviously learn he's up to something. But one thing that I really liked about when you do talk to Heisenberg, you know, one-on-one, uh, when you go to his factory, he's like, you know, she changed me, Mother Miranda. She, you know, she took something from me and, you know, here I am. So it kind of highlights, you know, how some people really are unwilling experiments. And that's what I really liked about that interaction. So I'm glad that character was there to further highlight the unjust actions of Mother Miranda and also kind of highlight how every Resident Evil villain kind of is. They always take it too far for their own gain. So Carl Heisenberg is a good character to showcase that. Um, But yeah, the way he talked was very strange. Um, The fandom online is saying he sounds like a very strained Nicolas Cage or um, you know <laughs> like the, you, okay. you can't quite place okay. it because it doesn't feel natural but he's also not a natural guy sure um, and perhaps he was a socially isolated person before being who he is now and that's kind of what got him into this mess in the first place but um, I'd be interested if it was a side effect of his magnetic powers like um Maybe the, just, I'm just bullshitting here, but maybe, like, the electrical impulses firing in his brain, yeah. like, interrupt when he's speaking or something like that, Possibly. Maybe? Um, you know, I'm, I won't say you, it's, it's a fantasy game. You can make up whatever right. explanation you want. I mean, um, I don't think anyone's life's going to be normal, again, after sure. being infected. Uh, clearly, you see that in the whole host of the Four Lords and Mother Miranda's Reach sure. as well. Um, but... Yeah, you progress through the area, you learn more about Heisenberg's motivations, you see all these things he's created. He's basically like a Resident Evil's Magneto Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein character, you know. Um, but I, I do agree that um, with the Lycans thing, it did look like Heisenberg was king of the Lycans. And it also looked like Chris Redfield was going to become a lichen. You know, like the way things were marketed and stuff it, like that. It, it kind of did, actually. And yeah. then he's got, he's got like the longer sideburns, so he just he he just looks hairy and yeah. haggard. Chris is very around. hairy, man. But, you know, the lichens are just a side effect of um, not having a high affinity to the Kado, which is Romanian, Romanian for gift or present. Oh, really? Yeah, I've been oh, actually looking up some of the bestiary names. Um Because Resident Evil does have a little bit of a history of um, naming their creatures after the area that they're from. Not all of the games do it, um, but the most notable games that did it before Resident Evil 8 were 4 and 5. Resident Evil 4 named its creatures after um, Spanish names because the game takes place in Spain, in a village in Spain. Okay. Yeah, because, oh, keep in mind while I'm on that, Resident Evil Village 8 pulls a lot of, you know, inspiration from Resident Evil 4 in terms of gameplay engine. That's and, in terms of the action feel yeah, of the game. Yeah, and the I'd, pacing. I had a lot of people be like, this is more like 4, and I'm like, I've never seen anyone play 4, so I don't know what that means. Yeah, but um, cool. super popular game in the franchise. Arguably the most popular. Um, oh, even really? though, yeah, Even though the, the first three and Code Veronica are the classics, you know, that are Resident Evil, what started Resident Evil. Resident Evil 4 brought extreme popularity to the franchise, and it's also the bridge between generations. So the okay. older players and the younger players are part of this franchise because of 4. Okay. And a lot of people would agree with that. Um, not a lot of people like 4 because it got rid of the tank controls, but Resident Evil has taken so much evolution. Like, it's, it's changed in a lot of ways. A lot of the games are not the same 
uh, but they all are tied together in some way, just like with Village, um, with the bioweapons coming from the Mutamycete or the Megamycete uh, underneath the Village uh, ground. But yes, let me go back to Heisenberg. Uh, Heisenberg, um, you know, his mutation is probably the most interesting out of the four. He can control electricity through his organs based on his in- mutation, his infection. It's the most, like, comic booky. Yeah. Out of everybody. Yeah, it's definitely the more more dangerous, you know. The, I mean, they're all dangerous. You know, Donna could make you walk off a cliff if she wanted to. Sure. Um, and then Moroke probably could have easily drowned you if you didn't make the right choice. And Alcina would just crush you and then drink you. So... Um, and I like how she didn't have fangs, but she was still very vampire-like, um, due to, cause you read, if you, as you read more lore, she had, um, and this is really good of, good of the game to do this, um, because a lot of royal families have blood diseases, like hemophilia and stuff sure. like that, so she's a noble woman, but she has a blood disease, because those families like to keep it all in the family, if you catch my drift, so, um, to keep the money and the estates and all that stuff, so... I found that extremely interesting and okay. yet also feeds into the Elizabeth Bathory kind of thing for her as well. Like, I need blood to, to sustain me, sure. you know? Um, but yeah, but Heisenberg definitely had the more reach and his area is a lot more dynamic. He is up to something. There are bodies everywhere. Well, some, of, and, some of the factory shots. It's just like yeah, endless streams yeah, yeah, yeah. of corpses. And, and I'm you like, would think there'd be lichens. No one noticed these things. Right? Like, what? You would think there'd be lichens, but uh, no, he definitely wasn't in charge of the lichens. The like that lichen was really just to describe their form. Um, they're just humans that have taken on a very grotesque um, form and shape, and have increased strength and agility and stuff from. You know, their faculties are gone in, in the sense of, like, human. Like, they're just acting on an impulse. Much sure. like how zombies just act on the impulse to feed on you um, after being infected by the T and G viruses. Um, so, yeah, when you find out that the lichens were not his thing, that was just failed Caddo experiments. And his thing is, I'm going to take failed Caddo experiments and outfit them. Weaponize them. Yeah, and I'm going to lead a rebellion. So he obviously does not like Mother Miranda. So that was, um, and that's a hard fight too, as difficulty increases. On casual, you can get away with it. On standard, you can get away with it. Um, Hardcore and of the Village of Shadows mode, Heisenberg is very hard to really to do so um i have not made it to village of shadows yet i'm still working through it um but the fandom online they're like hey guys like almost every other day you can look at a group question guys i'm not doing well with village of shadows what can i do to beat heisenberg on village of shadows mode because this is almost impossible and of course a personal friend of mine down uh in the city where i live he uh loves loves Resident Evil 2 and he was just messaging me like I'm two hours in and I still haven't beaten Heiserberg on Vi- on Village of Shadows. Wow. So a lot of people can kind of empathize with that oh that God. he's really hard on those higher modes. Jeez. So definitely leaves an impression in that way. Sure. He leaves an impression in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well and that's <laughs> I, I did really enjoy that the Four Lords all felt very unique um Watching again, having watched previous Resident Evil games, even even something like Seven, the the bosses kind of end up running together a little bit because you end up just getting like a big flesh monster at some point. Mm-hmm. And I I immediately think of like Resident Evil One, where it's like, oh, you fight an evil flesh plant, or oh, <laughs> you fight an evil flesh snake, right? And and then you fight an evil flesh guy. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of cool to have them all be such visually distinct characters um and then have them all have their own unique set of like skills and abilities that you then have to play their area of the game totally different that's by the time you get to heisenberg you're just shooting him right endlessly as compared to anything else where um i feel like against moreau is more like research management Mm -hmm. against donna is kind of just like fighting panic as you're running around her house uh lady dimitrescu was kind of not straight fighty 
uh, but more like long distance kind of fighting. Right. Um, and there was definitely some scripted events within the fight yeah. with her, which is very reminiscent of other bosses. Yeah. Like Nemesis and Mr. X. Okay. Yeah. And then we had Mother Miranda close out the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the reveals that Mother Miranda... One, I like that she was like 100 years old and she's been manipulating this village the whole time because of the... the is it Mega or Muta Mycete? They call it both. It, I would yeah. assume the Muta Mycete just kind of describes what it is and the Mega Mycete describes the source. Okay. So in the same way that, you know... Um, for I can't think of a better example than this right now. Um, the elephant's foot underneath Chernobyl was like this disgusting slew of radioactive material that was activated when the when the reactor went off. Okay. Um, and and you know the elephant's foot is the source of all that disgustingness, and then the radiation that comes off it is lethal. So you can think of the mutamycete as the radiation, and the elephant's foot as the megamycete, where the radiation comes from. Okay. Stuff like that. So that's the source, the megamycete, but the mutamycete describes what it does. And uh, So I like those elements. Um, I like the reveal that Oswald Spencer had spent time Loved at that. that location. Loved that. And that's where like he had kind of gotten the idea to start doing all the stuff that he does that leads to all the previous games. Um, the without getting into Mother Miranda's story, the main problem I had with it is they're like, okay, we explained where everything else came from, guys, but then they didn't explain where that thing came yeah. from. Yeah, I was just like, what? Now what is it? Is it a demon? Is it Cthulhu? Did it crash here on an asteroid? Like, yeah, and you I, know, ugh. yeah, ah. I I share your frustrations. I um, and that's not the first time Capcom's done something like that. Sure. Uh you know, for a while before Resident Evil 5 came out, you know, people just assumed the T-Virus was man-made, and then you learn Resident Evil 5, they actually come from a flower, and how do you isolate a virus from a flower, or where did these powerful flowers even come from? And then in Resident Evil 4, you, you know, you learn that there's this ancient parasite that the miners dug up, you know, and then those, it's called the Las Plagas, and then that plagued the That's villagers. I, I had heard it. I was like, yeah. I know what this is. But and I you're like, think of how it. did that get there? Like, how did, what's, what's the evolutionary story of the Las Plagas? And, you know, that's not super, you know, defined lore in Resident Evil 4 and, like, Resident Evil 7 and 8, like, you know, super defined, like, in your face, where did this Mutamycete or Megamycete come from? You know, uh, you know, if you don't read every lore file, and you might even still have missed it, even if you did. Sure. You know, uh, that's part of the. That's where I say the supernatural stuff comes in for Resident Evil is when some of the you know, vectors that cause these things, their origins are not deeply explained. That's kind of like the mystery, you know, because like it's it's more than just a mold. It's sentient. It catalogs things and that was that was this this felt like the most anime script based resident (laughs) evil i've ever seen like that's the idea of the mold acting uh as an information like holding receptacle um i thought was really interesting um simply because we humanity itself is reaching a point where we're trying to find non non non-physical based ways of storing information that's in the breath of the wild games um, your PDA basically updates with like a drop coming off of like a stone. And the idea there is information is stored in that liquid. Um, and that's something scientists are trying to figure out how to, how we could do if we could do it. So the idea that there's a biological matter that can do that is fascinating to me. And I think that's really smart sci-fi just being like, yeah, there's a thing. We, we've got a thing that can do it. It, <laughs> it remembers everybody that it infects. And that's just how it works, baby. Right. Um, I was annoyed at Mother Miranda being like, well, I'm going to get my baby back out of it. Because I was like, okay, how? Like, I'll, I'll believe you could access the information. But then she, she just kind of is just like, I've got a baby. <laughs> Be my baby this Be time. Be my baby. And I don't, like, th- clearly she's insane, so there's yes. only so much you can reason her, her plot for and plan. For sure. No one knows what being alive for so long and being involved with those types of things might do to the human mind or sure. mold mind at this point. Um, and whether it has an effect. Like, yeah. I, I have a hard time believing that something that has that much information stored within it 
has no degree of influence right. or control at all. Right, because ultimately, how these things work, you know, not so much like parasites, they want to be spread, right? With fungus or mold, um, you know, their reproduction and, and their life also matters on how far their reach can go. So they're going to do whatever they can do to get spread out even more. I, so. I hated that nobody ever wore like a breath mask. Right. Like, and I'm like, you know, bodies are decaying and they're just turning into dust. And I'm like, you're breathing in mold samples, people. Oh my you're goodness. You're killing me. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. But at the same time, you know, <laughs> Eth is just a regular guy, you know. Well, he's he's not a regular guy. You're right. And I didn't realize the foreshadowing until after I beat the game. She's like, you stupid man thing. I'm like, she never called him a man. Because yeah. he's not one. And and some of the Let's Players that I saw would point out, like, apparently man thing is like the insult of the day now. I don't, you, you know, you just brush it off because it seems like a joke. It just seems like an insult. Right. Um, that... Again, very anime kind of thing to do, I feel like. Um, that's one of those things where, like, I really want to sit down with an in-universe Resident Evil scientist and be like, okay, <laughs> I need you to tell me how a man dies, turns into a mold man, has sex with a woman, <laughs> has a baby, <laughs> goes through all this incredible action-based stuff, and then just dies at the end. Like, right. I don't I don't feel like the story ever gives you a good reason for why he died. Like he's beginning to lose like physical cohesion. I think um apparently the source of the Megamyce was destroyed. So technically any of its branched out mold affiliates that are currently taking form above ground would stand to reason that they died. Sure. You know. But who's um, most still alive? What's up? How's Rose still alive? I know. There's she's a lot of baby. strange things. She's yeah. half mold. She's half mold. Or, yeah, or, you know, is Mia fully... I sure. mean, you, you heal Mia. I mean, you have that section in the game where you can choose between Zoe or Mia, but it's canon to pick Mia to sure. live. Um, but, you know, is Mia... Like, you know, what are the implications? You know, um, no one knows for sure. Kind of like in um, Resident Evil 3 Remake... You can read one of Jill Valentine's files. She's like, you know, we're not zombies. We came back from the Spencer estate. We're not zombies, but does this thing have a long incubation time? Sure. You know, are we infected in a different way? Could we be carriers even yeah. though we don't show symptoms? Sure. So, I mean, maybe Mia is fully human, and the reason Rose is still alive is because she has her mother's human DNA. You know, there's some real-life examples of being homogenous or I'm sorry, heterozygous for certain afflictions is actually keeps you alive. So a huge example of that is um, in areas where malaria is very prominent, um, you'll find a lot of people with sickle cell. Now, if you're homozygous for sickle cell, meaning you inherit both genes from your, fam from your parents to have the sickle cell, you probably won't live very long. Um, it's very hard to live with sickle cell. Okay. Um, you can't get adequate oxygen. But if you have a lot of healthy blood cells in areas where there's malaria, that's more healthy blood cells for mosquitoes to infect. So if you're home, um, heterozygous for it, you have one, like 50% of your blood cells roughly are misshapen and the other 50% are not. You have a protective effect against malaria because you don't have a bunch of healthy red blood cells for them to infect. You don't have enough for it to propagate. Yeah, and oh, then also you have enough healthy red blood cells to be able to breathe and get oxygen to your organs. So, Whoa. yeah, the, and there's a couple examples of like that, you know, around the world. So maybe with Rose, you know, she has the benefits of being a mold person, but the health benefits of being a human. And she gets She's to- She's the daywalker. Walk. Yeah, she gets to- mold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She gets to, she gets to uh, have the best of, best of both worlds in that um, instance. So when the Megamycete was detonated, and also Ethan was right next to the detonation of the Megamycete. Sure. Um, perhaps uh, she was shielded from that. That's, um, obviously this one in effect rose because she had already been born. Uh, but it definitely stood out to me that when Chris rescues Mia, and she says, I was experimented on. And then, like, nobody brings it up at all. Right. Like, nobody's like, are you evil? Are you possessed? Are you anything? And she's just like, nope, I'm just Mia. Let's, <laughs> let's go save my baby and my husband. And let's GTFO, everybody. Yeah, there's definitely some unanswered things, um, you know, from the game. And 
just some narrative stuff that, like, even as a longtime fan, I'm like, okay, whatever. And, like, suspend some of my disbelief just so I can keep going, you know. But uh, hopefully, uh, if more DLCs come out and maybe Resident Evil 9 will piggyback off some unanswered questions with Resident Evil 8, because we do know, I believe Capcom released it somewhere, there is a trilogy, and 7, 8, is gonna, and 9 is going to be the last okay. one about this trilogy don't know if you're going to play as rose don't you know any of that like that but um hopefully maybe some more answers will come our way in the form of dlcs or future installments that was um oh i just had it like there was something you were saying and i remembered a question that i wanted to ask oh um i guess it's less of a question probably more of a complaint from a plot standpoint i didn't understand the need to cut Rose up, have Ethan, because, like, <laughs> and have Ethan be the one to reassemble her, because, like, they specifically make allusions, uh, Dimitrescu does it, and then I believe Mother Miranda does it, I think maybe Heisenberg does, um, they allude to the fact that they need Ethan, like, for the ceremony. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a reason why they don't just kill him, and that was Dimitrescu's big thing, she's like, I just want to kill him, and Mother Miranda's like, no, we need him for the ceremony, she's like, hang the ceremony! Right. Like, well, yeah, I mean, why don't you just kill him? plug the baby into the rock and then you get baby back. I don't, I don't you know, I don't know about know that. Uh, like okay. it seemed like I was sure know, I was reading too much <laughs> reading too far into it or not. Yeah. He, uh, ah. he obviously I think they knew that he was unique. Sure. And when he didn't, so they might have had some ulterior motive that due to us being the player character, those motives were not gonna be made clear to us. Um, you know, why he might be wanted. Um and then, but the flask thing it was very strange. You know, crystal, crystalline things was definitely a theme in this game, especially with a lot of the treasures yeah. you find. And I'm not quite sure, you know, if there is some biology uh, aspect between mold and crystals. I'd be very interested to see what that is. Generally, Resident Evil does their homework. You know, there's a lot of, especially when naming the creatures and stuff. So I'm sure there might be something there. If there isn't, I'd be surprised. But. Yeah, it was a very bizarre uh, twist of events, but um, when you get down to it, Mother Miranda is happy that you got the Four Lords out of the way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know what they intended uh, for all of them just to hold the flask and maybe help Mother Miranda carry the burden of welcoming Ava back into Rose's body. I'm not quite sure. Maybe she didn't know how that was going to go. I mean, how do you pull a deceased person out of the catalog, the the mold catalog? Sure. Um, You know, and then maybe things obviously changed because Ethan's showing up, throwing wrenches in their plans, you know. Who knows? Uh, You know, maybe there was something in the game that I missed, but I still remember on my third playthrough being like, that does seem like a bit much to do. Like, why would you separate the flasks? And then just bring the, when you really could have just put them together. Like I don't know, I don't know what that's about. What what were the yeah. roles of your four lords? But um, I'm sure Mother Miranda planned something, and then plans changed when Ethan showed up. So. Sure, that's possible. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was I? Oh, earlier you had alluded to the fact uh, that Lady Dimitrescu was ba- based some of the concept, anyways. Was based on Elizabeth Bathory? Yeah, just right? like bathing in blood, virgin's sure. blood. You know, the Tied castle. in with like vampire yeah. imagery and mythology. The castle only wanted women servants. And I don't know, when you when you hear that, it's like, are, um, does Lady Demetrisk have something against men? Does she sure. not like men? Or does she prefer women for something? And... Elizabeth Bathory preferred women, virgin women. Um, I don't know if the servants were necessarily going to be virgins in this game, but that illusion's kind of there. Like, I just want female servants. That's true. And um, what's really cool in, um, because like I said, some of the creatures are named after things from Romanian folklore. So even though this is an unnamed village, um, it's very quite clearly Romania. Um, even based on some of the food items you can purchase from the Duke, they're Romanian dishes. Oh, neat. Um, and I do want to just mention the Duke real quick. Sure. Because he is an allusion to Resident Evil 4, a traveling merchant you can purchase things from. But he sometimes will occasionally say, what are you buying? Ha ha. That's something an old friend of mine used to say. I love that. And now I'm just like, 
even how do you know the Resident Evil 4 Australian merchant who was somehow in Spain for some reason even as someone who'd <laughs> never played the game just because of the internet I knew the what are you buying what are you buying what like, are you selling that was a great that was a great little like yeah. incontinuity joke I thought that was really cool for I, sure I like the Duke I like, like him too you, you, you see him first the first time he like unfurls himself you're a little like whoa buddy like what are you Ugh. but it, how are you surviving in Romania without shoes but <laughs> But he's so charming. Like, I know, I like it. Just legitimately. He challenges um, tropes where someone of his size could not be likable. Sure. And he is extremely likable. He's very decent and professional, you know? And that's kind of like, it's kind of off-putting because you're like, you're dealing with all this shit. And here you just have a very charming corpulent man who's doing business with you in a remote unnamed village in eastern europe and that and his business model works for him somehow yeah. <laughs> you know, he's got a traveling caravan he's obviously very well fed he has a very strong horse <laughs> yeah seriously a single very strong horse <laughs> it's so bizarre but it's just kind of i just like seeing him in the games i really like seeing him and uh, I like I try to interact with him as much as possible because I want to see all dialogue. Even when, you know, I threw pipe bombs at him just to see how he would oh, react. Really? And he's like, "That's a strong weapon," and blah blah blah, like vetting. But um, the gut. Uh, what's different in this game is they don't let you shoot him. Okay. In Resident Evil Four, I mean, like I'm not a psychopath, but you can kill the merchant. Really. But he responds. Sure. You know, like, you'll kill the merchant. Like, he'll die. I don't know why you would do that. I mean, some people would just do their interaction and their transactions, and then they would just shoot the merchant just because you could. Aww. But he respawns in other parts of the I game. Would, I would love it if the game punished you by never spawning him again. Right? You just screwed yourself over. Right? But, oh. yeah. <laughs> but um, they don't let you shoot the duke. Sure. But you can throw a pipe bomb in his vicinity, <laughs> and he, res he responds with dialogue. You can't shoot him. You can blow him up. Yeah, That's I mean, like, and honestly, like... You know, a man of that size, I mean, his constitution survived that nearby pipe bomb quite well. Sure. Um, but yes, the Duke was there. But uh, what were I, what was I mentioning touching on the Duke? Oh, I was talking about Elizabeth Bathory and stuff like that. So yeah, Alcina had that, um, you know, that cultural, you know, borrowing from that. But also what's interesting about having only female servants work in that castle, they're named like, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, those creatures that you encounter in the dungeons, those are all females, because you know only females worked in the castle. They're called Moroeka, okay. which in Romanian is a female demon or spirit. Okay. And I thought that was very intelligent that you're naming the, you know, whatever horrible process that Lady Demetrescu and her daughters did to these female workers... You're naming them after uniquely female Romanian demons. Sure. And that's what they're called. Okay. Yeah, so I thought that was really cool. Very nice. And um, picks up on that uh, more like, you know, females only, you know. So maybe it isn't just, you know, Lady Demetrius doesn't like men. I mean, she very well may not. Sure. You know, uh, but there's, you know, allusions to the Elizabeth Bathory thing. So I liked that aspect of the castle that was uh one of my co-workers he was playing through the game and i was chatting with him about it and uh he pointed out that the four lords are basically kind of based on like horror like horror film monsters so you've got vampires werewolves uh heisenberg would be your frankenstein or dr frankenstein really uh moreau would be the creature from the black lagoon mm -hmm. slash the fish monster and then his name's an allusion to the island of Dr. Moreau. Yes. Where a scientist was turning animals into people. His clinic. Yes. And then um, Beneviento would be, I mean, mostly scary dolls. Again, I always flashed to Chucky. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's a very different type of scary doll. Right. For very different reasons. And the movies, to me, are more camp than they are actual horror. Right. Um, but I thought that was a really cool, like, theming use, too, of just, like, oh, they didn't just be like, we'll just throw whatever we want. No, for, who cares? Whatever. Like, the, the idea that even if it's just, like, we'll just echo some of these ideas, I thought that was a really clever way of building your main enemies in the game. Like, I thought it was really neat. Yeah, it, it's definitely very well-researched, um, stylistic 
kind of thing. And, and you know, supernatural, you know, literary, poetic uh, things is not new to Resident Evil. Resident Evil Village is not the first game to do something like that. You know, the mansion itself in Resident Evil 1 is ornate. It's obviously, you know, Gilded Age style, you know, decor. The puzzles are poetic. They pull off from medieval you know, motifs and stuff like that. So it's not new to have supernatural kind of themes and motifs in Resident Evil. Sure. You know, one of the things, the funniest comments about Resident Evil 2 is, what kind of police station looks like this? <laughs> now, of course, you know, in sure. Resident Evil 2 Remake, you learn from a little pamphlet that they turned a museum into a police station, you know, so that's why like it looks you the do. way. Because <laughs> that happens all the time, right? And um, Resident Evil 3, you know, not, you get to go back to the police station very briefly, but, you know, Resident Evil 3 is more like the disgusting survive the town or survive yeah. the city. But even then, you know, there's still some puzzles in Resident Evil 3 that pull on, you know, statues of angels and things like that. So that trope and those elements, they've been with us in the series for a long time. Same with Resident Evil 4. In Resident Evil 4, there's a whole section of the game that's in a humongous castle. Okay. You know, and Resident Evil 4 is divided in three parts. You have the village part, you have the castle part, and then you have the uh, island lab part. But the castle is huge. Same type of style of, like, creepy puzzles and ornate decor in the same way you see in Castle Demetresque. Um, same thing with, you know, not so much in 5 or 6, you know, a little bit more action-based and more, you know, tactical. But, again, it's not new to the series to have these types of, you know, literary illusions. Well, I, I think it keeps it from feeling like... It keeps it from feeling like any kind of schlocky horror game as well. Um, I, I don't want I don't necessarily want to say that it has a touch of class um, but it because it's such a trope and it's a well-known part of the kind of games these are uh, that's you know just pick up this put pick up this metal put this metal in this thing then you got to get a ball and put the ball over in this thing <laughs> um, it's a little bit fetch questy but again it, it does make it feel a little more than just a run and gun action game like in in the first game i feel like it was really to add in part of it's the exploration part of it's to keep you the more you have to explore the mansion the more likely you are to run into something dangerous and something scary um and just because of the limitations of the playstation one it's probably you could only load so much stuff at one time so you had to gate areas off for the player to keep getting further in the game um but yeah i feel like it's such a, a part of a resident evil game like without it you it's a house of the dead for sure. And those, then, you know. those those puzzles that are, you know, elegant, you know, that's definitely a part of the game. And, and what keeps it separate from being a supernatural game is having all that science fiction explanation. So it's a beautiful marriage between, you know, these gorgeous puzzles that have poetic stuff and then the science fiction explanation as to why sure. this is happening. So I think that's what makes Resident Evil unique and not just any, like, other horror game like Alone in the Dark, you know, or Sweet Home, you know, those old style sure. survival horror games that inspired Resident Evil, you know, this is its own thing. Was there anything about the game you would you would wanted to have seen changed or like an improvement you would have seen made? Were you just completely satisfied? Well, I am a lore heavy person. Um, I don't like not having answers to questions, so um, I would have had Miranda's lab a bit bigger. And um, just, like, a whole, like, manifesto on what Mother Miranda thinks the Mega My Seat is. You know, where it came from, how it came to be. You want the Resident Evil Bible. I do. I would love a Resident Evil Bible, actually. <laughs> uh, that, you know, things like that. I would like a little bit more, um, you know, how does the Caddo change a human? You know, we get, we get fed a lot of that with the T-Virus. You know, it, you know... It, changes your cells you know only wants to 
motivate your primary motor motor functions you know things like that so i would have liked a little bit more i just i'm more science heavy so i will i will eat that supernatural puzzles and motifs up i'll love it love it but you have to give me a science fiction a very solid science fiction bone at the end of the day sure um and you don't always get that you get a little bit of it um because again it's not a supernatural video game series it's a science fiction video game series so um, of course, they're gonna have that present, but I want I want the full nine yards. Like, give me the whole. I want the lab paper, the chemistry breakdown. Give it to me. <laughs> I want I want it. I want the. I want a scientist to jump out of the game and be like, "So this is what happened." <laughs> or I sit and I play a video game with someone who is like a virologist or an evolutionary biologist, and they just give me the explanations on how this works. Interesting. So. Um, but I don't think that makes fun for fun gaming. Sure. Like, here's the nine-page research paper on what the Megamycete is. Um, you have to do a puzzle to get access to the research paper. And then at the end of the research paper, there's a key to open the cell to get out. You know, like, some people are like, okay, I don't want that. Sure. <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> but that's what I would like. Very nice. Well, on that note, I think we're going to close it out. Um, I, I'm going to throw it right at the end. I think it's all aliens at this point <laughs> because you have no other science fiction concepts left to explore. It all came from aliens and that's where it's going to end. You'll fight. It'll be Halo, but Resident Evil. Yeah. Resident Evil 9 will be maybe Rose. Resident Evil 10 and it'll be like the Halo. O. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just going to be. Reboot the whole thing. Bioweapons from space. It'll be the flood. <laughs> the flood as zombies. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, if you guys want to check out Alexis's stuff, she is Bioelectricity on YouTube. There will be a link in the description that you can click on. Uh, also on Instagram, as you can see from the image on the screen, she has been doing some cosplays of Lady Dimitrescu's daughter. I don't remember which one specifically. Bella. There we go. Um, and otherwise, I hope everybody enjoyed this. Alexis, again, thank you uh, so much. And we will see you folks next time. Probably next time you see me, I'll be here with Ephraim. We'll be talking about Loki. Uh... And yeah, have a good one, everybody. And...